Good evening. My name is Harry Helling, and I'm the Executive Director of the Birch Aquarium at Scripps Institution of Oceanography, UC San Diego. Welcome to the Jeffrey B. Graham Perspectives on Ocean Science webinar series. This year, we are organizing these webinars as themed mini-series dedicated to the world-class research at Scripps. Tonight, we present the first in a three-part series dedicated to research for resilience on a changing planet. This series will spotlight Scripps oceanography programs that inform science-based decision-making, resource management, and climate change adaptation as a key part of their mission. It is my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker in this series, Dr. Julie Kalansky. Julie is an applied climate researcher at the California Nevada Climate Applications Program called CNAP at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. CNAP is a National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration funded team whose objective is to work with decision makers to facilitate the integration of climate science into decisions. Julie received her PhD in oceanography from Rutgers University in 2014 and joined Scripps as a postdoctoral scholar at the Center for Western Weather and Water Extremes, CW3E, that same year. She currently serves as researcher and program manager for CNAP, as well as operations manager for CW3E. Julie's research interests seek to link understanding weather and climate with preparation for extreme events and future conditions. These efforts include using historical observations to understand weather variability and impacts in the Western U.S., as well as providing future projections of regional climate variability. Julie routinely engages with regional stakeholders to better understand how this climate and weather information can be applied in decision making. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Julie Kalansky this evening for her talk entitled Drought in the West, Research and Scientific Tools for Coping with Climate Change. Thank you, Harry, for that nice introduction. So today I'm gonna to be talking to you about drought in the West and some of the research tools and scientific um, progress we've been making on how to deal with drought with climate change. Uh, so I'm gonna be talking about the work from a large group of researchers and we're all part of the California Nevada Climate Applications Program. And this is a program that is funded by NOAA, it's a RESA program. And our mission is to improve the resiliency in California and Nevada by providing decision makers usable climate information through integrating cutting edge physical and social science. And so what you see on the right is what we call a logic model and it shows the process that this group of researchers that are part of this team go through in thinking about developing usable science. And so there are a couple things that I just really wanna highlight in that logic model that shows the processes that we go through in terms of developing applied science. And so the first one is the priorities. And these are the topic areas that this group of us work in, which is water resources, natural resources, and coastal resources. And the one thing today that I'll be talking about, as I mentioned before, is drought, which is really relates to the water resources priority that we work in. In terms of what we hope to achieve, there's two parts of this. The first one is the outputs. And these are often the more tangible um, results of the research. So the research, which can be publications and reports. There's also an engagement piece of what we do, whether it's meetings or webinars or um, like what we're doing today. And then also a mentoring component of it. And so building capacity for future researchers to work in this realm of applied research in the climate field. And then the last part of is are these outcomes. And these are the, the things in science that typically can be harder to measure, but are really important for building resiliency. And so they're both near term, midterm and long term. And they're both what we do as researchers, but also that as a society, we're seeing these impacts, um, especially in the midterm and long term parts. And as I said, there's a team of us. And so this is the team um, as it is this year, there's been a lot of Zoom meetings. And so this was our um, annual meeting back in September. And I'll be sharing research from and results from many of the people that you see on this slide. So before I really start talking about the tools, because we're talking about drought and as you know, the governor has talked about recently, California is in a drought as in much of the West. And so what you're seeing here is the current status of drought from the drought monitor as of April 20th. And what you'll notice 
is that particularly in Nevada and Eastern California, and then also parts of Southern California that were in extreme or exceptional drought. Uh, and throughout the state, there's some form of drought throughout all of California. And then if we just look at the statistics for California, you can see, as I mentioned, at least 85% of California is from severe to exceptional drought. Uh, and if you look at this at just a year ago, is only 20%. So we've seen this great increase in the drought throughout the state. And so that kind of begs the question of how did we get to this drought? And so this is looking at the past two years. Uh, so there's been two dry years. And what oftentimes when we talk about drought and water supply, we talk about water years. And this starts in October and goes through September. And so by looking at the year in this way, it captures the main winter wet season, but then every now and then, especially in Eastern, uh, Southeastern California and Southern Nevada, there's some monsoonal precipitation. So it captures the water from both the main wet winter season and then the infrequent, but sometimes meaningful precipitation in the Southern portions of the region from the monsoonal rains. And so this is looking at the last water year, October 1st through 2019 from September to through September 30th, 2020. And what you're seeing is a percent of normal precipitation. Uh, and so as shown in the blue boxes here, much of the region received less than 70% of normal precipitation with the one exception being uh, far Southern uh, California. And so oftentimes when I talk about water year 2020, I say that there's this dipole, right? There was a dry Northern California, but the Southern part was not that dry. When you look at this water year through April 21st, you can see that this year has been even drier than it was the previous year. And so we're really seeing a combination of two dry years, um, which has led to the drought. This is just one way we've used to represent how dry it is. And this is how much water is missing since the start of the last water year, October 2019. And so these colors and these numbers represent is how many years worth of water is needed to catch up to normal. And so there's some spots that really jump out. And this is, you know, north of the San Francisco area where we see it's between one and one and a half years that we need for to catch up in terms of rainfall and precipitation. So this drought, especially for that region, is, is pretty severe. But you can also see throughout the state, there is quite a bit of water from rainfall that has been missing. And is this normal for California? And so some research from one of our, our CNAP members has really looked at the importance of big storms for wet and dry years. And so what you're looking at is in this figure is as a historical picture of precipitation. The mauve brown bars are representing for each year the amount of precipitation. Uh, and below, when it's going down, it's below what's normal. When it's going up, it's above what's normal. Uh, and the black line is the five-year moving average of precipitation. The green line is showing the less than 95th percentile storms. And so not the really big storms, but the red line is showing the greater than 95th percentile storms, so the big storms. And so, and what you see in terms of patterns, if you look at this red line, that really mimics the, what we're seeing in terms of this black line. And so the conclusion that can be drawn from this is really the big storms, the greater than 95th percentile storms that are most important for determining if it's going to be a wet or dry year in California. And these wet storms are mostly atmospheric rivers. And this figure here is showing a picture of what an atmospheric river is. This is looking at the water vapor, so how much water is in the atmosphere, and the bright colors are when there's more water in the atmosphere. And so atmospheric rivers are these long corridors of concentrated water vapor, and that when it intersects with the coast and the topography and lifts up, it can produce large amount of precipitation. And atmospheric rivers are very important for water supply. And so what you're looking at here is a map of, of the West and the percentage that atmospheric rivers contribute to the total precipitation. And there's this bullseye really in, in terms of the percentage in Northern California, where it's you know, upwards of 50%. And throughout most of the rest of the state, it's between 30 and 50%. So atmospheric rivers are, are very important for our overwater supply and contribute quite significantly to precipitation. So then that brings us back to the drought 
the past two years. And so if we look at this year, uh, what this map is showing is the atmospheric rivers that made landfall or hit the coast from the beginning of this water year, so October 2020 through April 5th. And the map in the background is showing the percent of normal precipitation. And the colors of the arrows represent the strength of the atmospheric rivers. And, and then generally, the stronger the atmospheric river, the potential for more precipitation or more rainfall from that atmospheric river. And so the weak ones that you're seeing are in blue, the moderate ones are in orange, the strong ones are in red, extreme are in pink, and there's no, no um, exceptional ones, but those would be in black. And so if you look at from what this year, there was really only one big atmospheric river that hit California this year, and that was at the end of January. There have been, in Northern California, there have been some weaker or moderate ones that have impacted uh, Northern California. And then this is combining the past two years of looking at all the atmospheric rivers that have impacted California, but just looking at the strong and extreme ones. And so what you can see here really is that for the last two years, we've only had one um, atmospheric river that was strong that has made landfall along the California coast. And so when you put these two maps together, what it really shows is that the drought these past two years has been um, in large part because of this absence of these large atmospheric river storms and also the, the absence of these strong atmospheric river storms. And so that is in terms of where we stand in looking about what has caused the drought and, and the current missing precipitation. What I'm going to turn to now is to talk about some of the different tracking tools that we have that look at um, how to track the status of the drought. So this next one is looking at how this year's precipitation compares to other years. And I've put the website here for of interest to every, anyone. And so the, the figure here is at the bottom, you can see the different months. Uh, and then the middle two, two thirds of the years are shown in dark blue and all years are shown in this light uh, blue color. And then you can see where we stand uh, for this year. Um, so far, it's about 50% of normal. And this is just for San Diego. Uh, on the website, there's for different, there's for LA, there's for California as a whole, there's for Reno um, and Clark County in Las Vegas, Nevada. And then there's also a table that shows how different storms uh, impact the total percent of normal precipitation. And so this is actually for San Diego just recently when we got the last rainstorms over the past couple days. And so what you can see is, you know, this is the current is for the overall. You can see what year was the record low, which was, you know, just about 27% in 2002. And the record high was 190% in 1980. Um, and then the in between is these percentile ranges. So the 50th percentile change with the 90th percentile change would be and so for those recent storms that we had, April 20th was the one day change. And so the 1J change was 71% of normal precipitation, and that puts us somewhere between the 50th and 90th percentile in history of how much of a change it's been. Um, and for the two-day change, there was a little bit that happened on the prior day, so it was a 75% of annual precipitation change, um, which is lower in that percentile over two days. And so this is an interactive way to see how storms actually impact where we are in terms of percentile and how big those storms are relative to history. Um, and depending on where you are, your region, you can look at your region specifically at the website. Another thing that we've been looking at is thinking about the storage between snowpack and the reservoirs. So in California, we use snowpack as a natural reservoir to store the water during the winter. And then as it melts, uh, it runs down into the reservoirs during the spring and summer when you know we need the precipitation and it's not falling. And so this is an image that combines both what is going on in terms of the snowpack and the reservoirs to get a more holistic view of how um, water supply is looking within the state. And so the figure on the right is a map of California and the different red dots represent different reservoirs that are included in this total. And so what you're looking at is this blue is the normal, so the average total from 2015 in reservoir storage of these different 28 reservoirs in the Sierras. 
And then what you're seeing on top is this, the gray is the snowpack. And so we can apply the reservoir storage plus the snowpack. This is what is normal for the history from 2000 to 2015. And so, and then the lines you're seeing this year um, is in the light blue is the reservoir storage, um, which is well below normal. And then also what you're, the, the snowpack. And so our snowpack this year what was definitely well below normal. And the other thing you're, you can notice too is that the snowpack is dropping off relatively rapidly. And so it's melting very quickly um, relative to this historical time period. So again, when these are taken together, it's an indication of the impact of these two years of drought, right? That the reservoirs came in about normal, but with the lack of precipitation and the low snowpack combined over all our reservoir storage within uh, California is pretty low currently. Another tool that we've developed is to look at how this drought historically compares to many others going far over a hundred years. And so what this does is it looks at, NOAA provides what are called climate divisions. And you can see a map here of the different climate divisions. And this map showing is from climate division two. So up here in central Northern California, and it's looking at different stages of drought and drought can have various different stages because it can last for different periods of time. So this time scale on the left is showing the, the months. So whether it's a one month for the first bar, three, six, nine, 12 to two years into three years. So if you total the precipitation over that time period, whether it's one month to 36 months, it's looking at how this drought in a percentile way compares to previous droughts over that time period that you're seeing on the um, left axis. Uh, and so if you look at this drought, um, cur the current ongoing drought compared to, you know, the more recent 2012-2013 drought, it is, you know, in, compared to 2014, it's in that two to fifth percentile uh, range of how dry it has been. We're seeing some dryness showing up in the three year, the 36 month, but just because it hasn't been that long, we're not seeing really this extended drought um, period uh, currently. But you know, it's everyone's, <laughs> if we had a magic eight ball, maybe we'd be able to fill it in, but everybody's best guess in terms of what might happen in this three year and extended range drought period. And as I mentioned, this is something that can be taken back to over a hundred years. And so besides being, a, I think, a very cool mosaic of different colors, um, but it gives you some insight into how variable our climate is and how we can go from, you know, very extreme drought years, like in 76 to 77, to relatively wet years, and which really mitigates the drought. Um, and this is, you know, also, also what we saw in the 2012-2016 drought, um, when it ended up, um, 2017 was extremely wet year, and you see the mitigation of the drought, and then the start of this most recent, the two years of this most recent drought that I've been talking about. In addition, we look at the impacts to soil moisture and to the landscape. And so what you're looking at is a hydrologic model output of soil moisture for to, that indicates drought intensity in the region. And so similar, the darker colors are where there is more um, drier soil moisture, more extreme drought. You know, again, that region in, in Northern California really stands out um, in terms of missing precipitation. Um, I will add that on this website, it shows different hydrologic model results for soil moisture just because there are some model to model differences. Um, but when you see the models agree, it's an indication of these areas in, in that soil moisture is especially dry. In addition to soil moisture, another way of looking at drought is the evaporative demand or the atmospheric thirst for water, which can exacerbate droughts. And so what this image here is showing is these different components of, of drought, right? The precipitation that comes in and the evapotranspiration from trees and what evaporates off the land, but then also this component of the atmospheric thirst of, you know, if there was unlimited water in the land, how much would the atmosphere uh, pool from the land? Um, and so this is the, the difference between the evaporative demand and evapotranspiration really has to do with the vegetation um, because evaporative demand is just based on climate variables. Uh, so it's calculated using temperature, humidity, wind speed, and solar radiation. And so whatever, you don't need to know necessarily the vegetation to have an estimate of how the atmosphere is impacting the drought. 
And so using this as Eddy, which is called the evaporative drop demand index, and it's looking at the anomalies of evaporative demand over a specific time window. And so this is just showing what, you know, here's kind of, here's a bell curve of where evaporative demand can be. And when it's higher, you know, it's on this very high end of evaporative demand. And, um, and this is where you can see the different colors and I'll show on the next screen. And then when it's a lower and there's not as much of this evaporative demand, it's in these blue colors. And so this is a map of Eddy of looking the anomaly of evaporative demand over the last six months. And so really since the beginning of the water year, and you can see how the atmospheric thirst has been warmer and you're seeing this high evaporative demand um, in Southern California and Southern Nevada, but also again too in this region in Northern California that has really lacked precipitation. Um, as mentioned before, you can do this on different time scales. And so over this past, just this past month, the evaporative demand throughout much of California has been even higher than over the last six months. Also, the one thing that I want to point out is a lot of this information and summaries of drought information can be found on drought.gov. About every month now, we're doing a drought status update that summarizes a lot of this information. So if you want to follow the status of the drought from physical variable perspective, we are summarizing this and also providing some impacts on it. And to, to find the specific California, Nevada region, if you go to location and go to California, Nevada, you can see the drought status updates. They also have specific um, drought information by location as well. This is just one way to keep current about the status of the drought. So that was a lot of information about the drought. I wanted to do a summary here before I start talking about some of the research we're doing to, to really um, think about future droughts and how to deal with it in climate change. Um, so as I mentioned, we're on the second dry year for California and it's very much a deepening drought. Uh, the drought has been caused by a lack of large storms, particularly atmospheric rivers over the past two years. Uh, the snow has been much below normal for this time of year, um, as are reservoir levels, and we've seen the early snow melt this year as well. Uh, in terms of the history of it, we're seeing that precipitation is in this um, two to fifth percentile for lack of precipitation, both from the three to 24 month time periods. Um, soil moisture is dry and also the atmospheric demand for drought. And so, and, and I mentioned this before, but in terms of following, if you're interested, there is under observations on the CNAP website and also drought.dev is, is a way to follow and these tools that I've mentioned and, and to see how the drought status evolves going forward. So now I'm going to turn to some of the research topics that we are looking at related to drought. And so the first one goes back to the eddy that I showed, the evaporative demand, the anomalies of it. And so this was work that was showing how eddy is a predictor of fire risk using fuel moisture. And so what you're seeing here, this is a correlation. So how eddy is related to that 100th hour fuel moisture fire danger. And these red colors that you're seeing in this map is an indication that eddy is really um, strongly related or has this relationship with the fuel moisture fire danger. Uh, especially in the summer. So if, what, what this is showing is if you look at Eddie at the beginning of the summer, there's an indication of what that may mean for the end of the summer fire risk. So now we're taking this and looking at it in the future. Um, and these figures I understand are quite complex. Um, so I'm gonna walk you through these, uh, but the, the big home take home message of this is extreme eddy period. So this extreme drying of the, of the landscape, which can increase fire risk is going to increase in the future. And so what you're looking at here is this was an earlier study, not looking at the future, but the current conditions of how eddy at the beginning of the summer season relates to fire danger at the end of the summer season. And so the colors are showing a correlation or the relationship between high eddy and, and low uh, fuel moisture or fire danger at the end of the summer. And so the, the warmer the colors is, the stronger this relationship. But overall, throughout uh, California and Nevada, you can see this is a relatively strong uh, relationship. Now we're taking this to, to look at in the future, and I understand that these two figures are quite complex and we'll walk through, but the big take home message from this is, is that extreme drying or eddy periods will increase in the future. And so if we're just looking at the one for the South Coast, um, so what they're looking at on the, 
the y-axis is the number of extreme drying days or 95th percentile days and at different points in the future. And so early century is 2010 to 2040, 2040 to 2070, and late century is 2070 to 2100. Um, and the, the circles are for summer and the blue is for autumn or the triangles are for autumn and the filled in are when you take many models together and average them together, this is the result that you're seeing. Uh, and the big take home message for all of these is that for both of these, you see an increase. Um, the summer increase is greater for both the South Coast and the kind of mid coast to Mendocino, so Northern California coast, uh, then autumn. And there is quite a bit of variability, but overall what this is showing is that these extreme drying days would contribute to fire risk are going to become more prevalent in the future. And it varies some by region, but that trend is the same throughout California and Nevada. A similar study just looked not on that atmospheric thirst, but also drought combined. Uh, so the, the top figure is showing the, the fifth percentile drying. Um, so the driest 5% of days, this is historically, and then on the um, right side of the blue line is in the future. And the big difference between the top and the bottom is that the top includes this evaporative demand or what the atmosphere is doing, and the bottom does not. It's just looking at precipitation. And, and each one of these rows is, is a different global climate model that's projecting into the future. And so if you're just to look at this, I think the big thing that you notice is there's a lot more red or a lot more of these three-year drought periods in when you include evaporative demand than when you just look at precipitation. And so that's really the take-home message of this is that for future planning around drought, ecosystem health, wildfire risk, restoration, those atmospheric influence of drought really need to be considered. And, you know, going back to that logic model that I showed in the beginning is how does this lead to resiliency? We're actually working with the fire community and just recently trying to have discussions with the fire management and forest service of, of incorporating this idea of looking at the, the atmospheric impact on drought, not just the precipitation. Another project we're looking at is thinking about what determines when a drought is declared, which is very timely given the um, most recent announcement by Governor Newsom about the, the drought. And so we're doing this in a historical setting, not just um, in, the, in the current one. And so looking at historical declared droughts, which are listed here in 1976, 77, 87 to 88, um, 2007 to 2008, um, 2013 and 2014. And we're looking at both the physical parameters and the social discourse around drought. And so this project, and I've been part of it, has been super interesting for me because it integrates the physical science and the social science of when droughts are declared in California and Nevada. And so this is just an example of some of the different um, processes that have been going through for the, the social discourse. And so looking at who's been talking about drought and what they are saying. Um, so I'll just you know go through these from the different droughts, but you can see the reporting on it and how much that matters. So the water rationing, the Central Valley and agriculture is a big one. The ranchers are expecting disasters. Um, what lakes are drying up? And so in looking at all these different news articles, there's some consistencies and inconsistencies between the declared drought. In terms of consistency, some of the physical measurements, which I'll talk about more in just a second, are snowpack, a critical dry year, below normal reservoir storage. Um, some things that have been more inconsistent are the actual levels of precipitation and reservoir storage. And in terms of the social discourse, again, this is something I'll talk about in the next slide, but the declaration occurs during a second dry year. Um, you see a greater prominence of government actors, the prominence of precipitation. Um, prior to the drought being declared, there's an uptick in the media coverage of the drought and the responses for financial aid and conservation measures. Some of the inconsistencies are when the drought is declared during the second year, the economic sector that's cited or quoted most often, and the prominence of an infrastructure solution and the concerns for fires. So from a physical variable perspective, we're looking at, um, have developed a dryness index, which includes 
several different um, components of the physical variables. One is low precipitation, another is low reservoir storage, um, low runoff, low snowpack, and then also the evaporative demand, that high thirst for that of the atmosphere for water. Uh, and so what this next figure is showing is this dryness index for each individual year. And this on the bottom is for this year and up here is for the previous year. So for example, 2014 had a high dryness index. All those variables that I just talked about uh, were high or low respectively. And the previous year, it was also very dry. And so this is a combination of the year prior uh, and the year that the drought was declared. And so it's really at least in the second year of drought that it's waited for any sort of drought declaration, which I think is an important finding. Um, and you can see most of these are the red or when the drought was declared, the orange are where it was in drought. And there are some instances that, for example, 2002, that kind of reaches this threshold that maybe that should have been a declared drought. And so thinking about why, based on the physical parameters, it wasn't um, a declared drought is something that we are currently looking at and is part of this research project to understand the, the social discourse around it and how that impacts whether or not a drought is declared um, and then the potential implications going forward of that. Another part of this that we have not gotten to in terms of the research is to apply this current understanding of the dryness index to think about how droughts may be called or may change in the future. And, and so applying what we've learned to global climate models and see how this changes in the future is one of those next steps that we're looking to take with this project. And the last project I'm going to talk about is a drought amelioration outlook. And so this involves looking at subseasonal forecasts, so approximately one month forecast. And I think as we all know, knowing what's going to happen in a month in terms of weather, especially during the winter season and when rains will come, is extremely difficult. And so the idea of this is to combine both hydrologic modeling and some new subseasonal forecasts to get a better sense of these periods of times where, you know, for example, we were in a drought and then you see this relatively rapid drop off. So when are there any indications at longer lead times that we might be getting out of a drought? And so, as I mentioned before, there, the, when we look at the soil moisture, there's this, uh, we've developed hydrologic models to look at drought indicators. And so the idea of this project is really to look at subseasonal forecast. They're becoming more and more frequent and being released more frequently. Combining that with these hydrologic models to come up with at least a weekly drought amelioration outlook. And so is there any signs to, taken together that droughts may be ending? Um, and as part of this too, there is an active evaluation and feedback from users of this. And so this is just showing some of the summary results of people that we have talked to um, who we think this might be most useful for. Uh, and some of the things that have come up is the court spatial and temporal scale, the fact that these forecasts don't come out very often and they don't have very high resolution. So it's not necessarily on a watershed scale level. Um, one thing that, you know, as I mentioned before, is really hard with subseasonal forecast is there's so much uncertainty around it. And then also the communication, because it is something that is relatively new um, and there is this doubt and uncertainty. So the communication and understanding about what it is that is able to show what the skill is. And so we're hoping that understanding, you know, some of these challenges in using these forecasts will actually help us be able to make better, more useful forecasts as part of this project. So that's just a, a summary of some of these projects that we're looking at is this, you know, like I talked about the evaporative demand or at atmospheric thirst and how important that is to consider when you're talking about future drought um, and especially the increase for fire risk. Drought declarations, what we're seeing and really only come after two years and requires uh, several different physical variables, and then also the how media coverage and the social discourse around drought, uh, especially leading up in the months prior leading up to the drought declarations are important. And the last one is knowing will, when drought will end will, is extremely difficult, but we are hopeful we, by using some new uh, forecast technologies and modeling and with an engagement process that we can make some headway uh, on being able to better communicate and prepare uh, communities for drought ending. Uh, so I think now we're gonna turn to questions and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have about what I've presented or the drought in general. So thank you very much. 
Thank you, Julie, for a wonderful presentation. That was extremely informative um, and uh, really appreciate your insight into drought in uh, what is turning into uh, a drought year uh, or drought couple of years. Um, we do have a couple of questions. Um, first of all, um, there was uh, one uh, viewer who noted that in California, at the California-Nevada border, um, that, that seemed to be less affected uh, by um, eddy and uh, and soil moisture issues, so it seemed seemed less of a uh, of a problem area um, than some other parts of the state. And they were wondering uh, why that was. I think most people think of Nevada as being exceptionally dry, so I'm curious about that. Yeah, in terms of so eddy is a relative uh, to what the region would experience climatology climatologically. So even if you consider an area that is generally super dry, it's relative to that super dry area. And so that's one part of it. And I was actually looking, I saw the question come in and I was looking at some of the components of what is incorporated in any in terms of temperature, humidity, wind speed, and solar radiation. And the only one that I could see really quickly is temperature, thinking that that, for some reason, that area may be, and temperature um, in that region is no different than the surrounding regions. And so it must be one of the other three components, but I don't have enough information offhand and I, um, to really know why specifically that region is has been left less affected. It isn't it hasn't been because of more precipitation or anything in that region. And so it has to be one of these other atmospheric variables. Um, I, I have a question. In fact, I have a couple of questions. And one is, um, I was really struck by the evaporative demand. And I hadn't really thought of that before your talk, uh, how much the dryness of the atmosphere actually impacts um, drought. And it really showed up uh, as you showed as such a key factor in the in the projections for the future for that that would be a, a determining factor um and i wonder um well first of all i think that's that's interesting uh phenomenon i don't know if you want to speak a little bit more uh, about that and and the sort of climatological conditions that lead to that situation as opposed to say precipitation like the stuff that we um that we normally expect from things like atmospheric rivers but also i was curious does that actually impact reservoir storage? I wonder if we have really high uh, evaporative demands, does that actually diminish uh, reservoir storage to any significant degree? And I apologize if that's a little bit out of left field, but um, I was curious. Yeah, so the first question in terms of evaporative demand in the future, the, we've looked at this and broken it down by the different components of evaporative demand, and it's actually part of that study. And temperature is really the driving force of de evaporative demand in the future. And so... Um, because as temperature increases, evaporative demand increases, that's really why you see the increase. And I think the argument could be made even in the two most recent droughts, the 2012 to 2016, and then the current drought, that temperature is playing a role. And there's been studies that have shown that. And so that, that um, in terms of climate change, is, is really the big driver is temperature. Uh, in terms of the studies that I've seen in terms of evaporative demand for reservoir levels, it does impact them, but it's not, it doesn't significantly move the needle relative to a lot of, especially the large reservoirs, relative to a lot of the other major impacts. You know, for example, the drying of the soil moisture um, when we're getting storms. And so the filling of the soil moisture and reducing runoff has, is what, people are more focused on rather than the, the evaporative demand off the reservoirs. Not to say that that doesn't matter, it just doesn't move the needle as much as some of these other um, variables. Yeah, and um, if you don't mind, I have uh, another question, which is, um, have you guys done any assessments of um, extended droughts? I know that historically, um, more in the, um, in the paleoclimate record, there's evidence of extreme droughts that goes over protracted periods of time. Uh, I, I wonder if that's anything that your team or group works on at all. So this was a study uh, with a slightly different group that we did when actually not long after coming to Scripps. And it was what we did was combine different types of droughts. So did some scenarios and and they're not the kind of the mega droughts or the really extended droughts. I think that, you know, we've seen in kind of the medieval dry climate or medieval um, climate period or some of the other ones that you see in the paleo record, uh, but took the what was then a, the current 2012 to 2016 drought and then put historical droughts on top of that just to see what would happen. And one of the things that we saw is when there was a, a shorter drought, 
and then a wet year, it was easier to get out of drought. Um, but when you have these long extended droughts, even when you have a wet year, it just takes longer to kind of reach that that normal. And and so it the the how acute a drought is versus how long it is has different implications um, in in terms of getting out of drought. Um, and then there's another question that's coming in that that asks, um, how do you incorporate the status of aquifers into the assessment of drought, or is that incorporated into into the drought uh, calculations? Yeah, so very much so. One of the things I um, didn't show, but it looks at both the reservoirs and snowpack, and so that's definitely one of the combinations to look at in terms of aquifers and um, and snowpack and how those combined. And then there's also the, the, what we've seen in terms of looking at various different variables for drought, how it usually takes at least two years to really have an impactful drought in California. And that has to do a lot with, with the reservoirs. And then also I realized now that you were probably referring to groundwater aquifers too. Um, and that is something that in California can be, we as a state have not done a great job in monitoring it, though there has been new regulations that that will become monitored more regularly um, starting, I think, this year or next year. And so that is that is something that has been very difficult to assess during droughts. Uh, a lot of the models, you know, there's a long delay in getting the information needed to um to, to, to drive the models to understand what the groundwater pumping is. And so that, that is, that's definitely something that we are, we are working on and is kind of an active, um, active area of, of kind of improving monitoring overall. Yeah, that was a great question. Um, and then I'm curious about the dryness index. Um, I think that seems like such a great standardized metric for, um, really, nailing down, um, drought conditions and drought declarations. And I wonder what you guys are doing um, to to make that the standard metric and really uh, drive the community towards you know a more uniform way of uh, communicating to the public about that. Uh, so I guess my answer to that is droughts are super complicated and they're very unique depending where you are and where you're getting your water from. And so this is really a, the statewide assessment, right? So it, for example, it included snowpack and it included reservoir levels, but for some areas, depending on where they are getting that, getting their water, those are less important. And so I think the idea of a dryness index is, and having that for some sort of metric of knowing and, and kind of foreseeing potentially when drought is coming is a good idea, but there's a lot of nuance between different regions. And that's one of the things that makes drought so difficult is that there, there's different types of drought. And also because water supply is so variable that that, that can be hard. And so um, specifically in this project, like I said, we're looking at California as a whole, and we've been talking with some um, colleagues at Department of Water Resources about it. Uh, but we're not, it, I would say it's hard to be too prescriptive of, of local droughts. Yeah. Well, well, Julie, I really want to thank you for a wonderful talk. Um, I think it's incredibly important. And I want to thank the entire uh, CNAP team uh, for the work that they're doing um, in helping us uh, actually come up with tools to cope with climate change. So uh, very much appreciate your talk. And I want to thank everybody for coming and remind you that we do have two more talks in this series on research for resilience on a changing planet. And we hope to see you all in the coming months at future talks. Thanks very much. And everybody have a lovely evening.